Hello, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud, while stoned. Today we're going to do part two of Little Blue Book, number 467, and it is titled Evolution Made Plain, written by John Mason. And we left off on page 17, so here we go. Connecting links. There is a greater unity of all life than the... Oh, yeah. All life and many divisions and subdivisions of the of the analyst would seem to warrant the dividing lines between the different classes, orders, families, and species are more apparent than real. The barriers of separation not so impassable as appear at first sight. To begin at the bottom, there is no hard and fast line between living and non-living matter. Or at least, it is not always easy to say where the line should be drawn. Tyndall says, The tendency of modern science is to break down the wall of, part or of partition between the organic and the inorganic, and to reduce both to the operation of forces which are the same in kind, but which are differently compounded. Passing on to the first grand division of life, it would seem that nothing could be plainer than the line of cleavage between vegetable and animal life. Yet there is a twilight zone between the two where each shades off toward the other, and which is inhabited by several living species of so doubtful a nature that scientists cannot agree as to which of these two great kingdoms they belong. These doubtful organisms are claimed by both the botanist and the geologist and are described in the textbooks of both. Really, they do not belong to either division, but are simply organisms that have not risen in the scale of life to the diverging point of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. Ascending the animal scale, we come to the line separating the invertebrates from the vertebrates. Here, on the invertebrate side are species that have the beginnings of a backbone, an elastic smooth cord, and gill slits, thus pro proving their relationship with the fish, the lowest of the vertebrates. The connecting line between the fish and the reptile groups is the amphibians, frogs, newts, salamanders. The frog in its tadpole stage is a fish but acquiring legs and lungs it becomes an air breather, a land animal. Between the reptile and the bird, and having certain characteristics of both, there are at least three extinct species known by their fossils. One of these, Arthropithic Arco... Let me see if I can pronounce it. Archosopithex. Ar arch... Uh, Opatrix. I don't know. Had the skeleton and feathers of a bird, but and a reptile tail composed of 20 vertebrae. Another was a flying reptile with a bird-shaped head. Reptiles, snakes, lizards, turtles, alligators, etc., are cold-blooded, egg-laying animals. Birds retain the egg-laying characteristic of reptiles, but are warm-blooded, like the mammals. The latter differ from both birds and reptiles in producing their young alive and suckling them. Between the mammal and its ancestor, the reptile, but classed with the former is the duck mole of Australia. It is an egg-laying, web-footed, duck-billed quadruped. After its young are hatched, they are suckled in a sort of mam mammaria pouch, which is without nipples. Okay. Let me see. What they call this? I'm talking about the platypus, but they called it by a different name. Okay, in a sort of mammary pouch, which is without nipples. Above the duck mole, but so low in the mammal group that they are not really mammals, are the marsupials, and kangaroos, and possums. Their young are so immature at birth that they are, for some time, carried in a pouch by the mother. We have now come to the last great chasm, that between man and the other mammals. As man belongs in the same group with them, the chasm is not so great in the sum of physical characteristics as it is that between the fish and the reptile groups, or between the reptiles and the mammals. 
In regard to man and the higher apes, the dividing line, viewed from the standpoint of descent, is vertical rather than horizontal, like that between mammals and birds. One moment. Realized I forgot to turn something off. There, that's better. There are no species extinct or extant between man and the ape. It is not necessary for the proof of evolution that there should be missing links. Are not more required here than they are between birds and mammals, which were evolved side by side from reptiles. If ten feet below the topmost bough of the tree there is another branch, it is not necessary or show it is not necessary to show that there are or have been intermediate branches to prove that both grew from the same trunk. Missing links are required only on the line of descent. Discoveries of the fossil remains, and there is a lot of missing print here, far more are far more rare for many reasons. One, land animals rarely leave their remains in the sediment of sea and lake. Two, there is small chance of the sediment containing the fossils of necessity arrived animals before mm, the latest animals. Okay, we're going to have to finish. We're just going to skip the rest of the page. That's a shame. That's page, uh, let me see, 19. So we'll go to 20. And that's one of the first times I've had that happen where I couldn't read almost an entire page of the book because of print missing. Alrighty, page 20 we'll start off. The earth as yet has been searched and nearby all the and nearly all the fossils discovered have been ac accidental. For these reasons the geolog geological record in respect to fossils evidence is far from complete. Yet from time to time, new discoveries are filling in the gaps in the record. Anthropologists present us with evidence of prehistoric races that were far lower than the lowest savage of today. Some of the evidences of man's existence tens of thousands of years ago were known before Darwin set the world astir with, the, with his revolutionary discovery. And the old school geologists like Hugh Miller, who had not been entirely weaned from the scriptural lit literalism, were sadly puzzled in regard to the evidences of these pre-Adamites. Fossils have been found showing several gradations or stages in development intermediate between man and his pre-human ancestor. Evidences which, if they do not completely bridge the chasm, stand as ruined pillars, broken arches, isolated spans, of the bridge over which man was many hundreds of thousands of years in crossing. The first skull discovered 60 years ago of the Neanderthal man was so entirely different from other prehistoric skulls that one scientist declared it was a malformation, but other fossils were found later that proved the peculiarities to be racial characteristics. These men who lived in Europe down to 30,000 years ago, were squat, bent-kneed, thick-skulled, almost chinless, and with ridge-like projections over deep-set eyes. In skull development, they were lower than any savage of today. Older than the Neanderthal race, and lower in the human scale, were the Heidelberg men, said to have been the first really human beings of whom we have fossil evidence. Judging from the age of the fossil beds, they existed from 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Thirty years ago were found some of the fossil remains of a creature in Java, some 40 feet below the surface, that show characteristics intermediate between the gorilla and Neanderthal man. The lowest human cranium yet described, very nearly as much below the Neanderthal as this is below the normal European. This creature was named Pithecanticus Pith erectus, erect ape man. Lack of space prevents even a brief description of other and intermediate types of man, such as the man of Spy, of Nolet, of Predomost, etc. As the more man develops, becomes specialized, the farther he is removed from the lower animals. 
So, in tracing his descent toward his origin, we find him approaching them, apes included, in general characteristics, for we approach the point of divergence. Evolution is a fact. There is no doubt of that in the minds of those who have investigated the subject without prejudice and with the acquisition of truth as the sole aim. One may dispute a fact, but he cannot deny it out of existence. Those who feel a sense of shame for their close proximity to their cousin, the monkey, are advised to increase that distance by carrying a higher development than though by carrying to higher development those traits considered peculiarly human. Or, yeah, par particularly human. We'll put that word in there. Reason, a sense of justice, of broader sympathy and tolerance. By his great... Dis okay, missed the page there, apparently. That did not make sense. Okay, reason, a sense of justice, of broader sympathy and tolerance. I guess not. By his great discovery, Darwin delivered the heaviest solar plexus blow to human vanity it ever received. For this, he deserves and receives the eternal gratitude of every right-thinking man and woman. How was evolution brought about? What are its laws, and how do they work? And that's the end of that chapter. I'll take a drink, because i got a lot of cotton now. And a new chapter begins. Natural Selection When the farmer or the stock breeder selects his seeds for his animals for propagating purposes, he has an eye to a great natural law, heredity. He knows that scrub animals and the seeds of degenerate plants will stamp their inferiority upon their descendants. He has learned that like, that like produces like. Therefore, he selects such seeds and animals as will produce those best suited to their purposes. He is not only guided by his knowledge of a great law of nature, but in the main, he is following her method in preserving and improving the breed. Thus, method of, ch of changing and improving plants and animals under domestic domestication. domestication is called artificial selection. Plants and animals in a natural state are capable of multiplying at so enormous a rate that there is an insistent struggle for existence going on among them. If it were not for this fierce struggle with one another and with their enemies and their environment or environmental forces in which the vast majority die early, the world would be overstocked. There is hardly a species of animal of which a single pair would not choke out, cho choke out all other animal life in a few generations by filling the world with its descendants. If all of the one species were permitted to reach old age, if a pair of elephants, one of the slowest breeding species of animals, should bring forth only six young ones, and all should have one hundred all should live for 100 years, their descendants, something years, would number 19 million, a number so great that they would form a closely packed herd occupying 41 square miles. The condition produces 9 million eggs a year. Okay, something produces 9 million eggs a year. Still some print missing in this one. If one egg should develop into a mature fish, half of them females, in 10 years the sea would be f would be a solid mass of codfish. That's what the missing word was, codfish. This tendency to increase at so tremendous a rate, and the fact that no two individuals are exactly alike, supply the material and the conditions for the great law of natural selection to operate. Each individual must be, must of necessity, compete so fiercely with other animals of the same species and of allied, allied species and with enemies with climate and changing conditions that out of the struggling many only a few live to propagate those individuals that vary from the mass in the right direction live the others die 
leaving few descendants or none. Though like, though like produces like, there are no two individuals exactly alike. If all of the same species were alike, there would be no opportunity for the law of natural selection to operate. Nothing but chance would determine, in the struggle for existence, which individuals would live to propagate their species and which would die without descendants. Nor would it matter, so far as the species is concerned, but individuals do differ in their traits in some degree. Turning of the page. Pardon me. Wallace has shown that variation usually amounts from 10 to 20, sometimes 25% of the varying part. And this variation, even if small, often spells the difference between an early death with no descendants and a long life with numerous prodigy. By the law of heredity, the descendants are endowed with a greater or less degree with the same life-saving characteristics of their parents, each generation being subjected to this weeding out process, and only a few of the best fitted individuals being selected to preserve the species, we can easily see that, as the generations come and go, these essential life-saving characteristics or traits are being developed to a greater and greater degree. And this means change, modification of species. With horn or tooth or claw or hoof, or sting of poison or odor among all the wild creatures that swim or crawl or run or climb or fly. The struggle for life and food and mate goes on today, just as it has gone on for millions of years. Other factors in the struggle are alertness, agility, cunningness, sharpness of vision and hearing and smell, protective color of covering, fleetness of foot and wing, the degree of heat, the amount of moisture in the food supply. The traits that survive are, of course, those that are the most useful in a given environment. By environment is meant surroundings, all outside influences, the not-me of each individual. A change of environment of the conditions of life calls for a readjustment of the traits most vital to the individual in the new environment. In one environment, one highly developed trait would be most useful, while in another, some other character or set of characters would be the saving factor. Because a change of environment means a change of weather conditions, or the food supply, and the means of getting it, of enemies, etc. From the foregoing brief outline, it would seem that only a little exercise of reason is required of anyone to see that natural selection operating is on like environments would, in the course of their generations, produce from the same species types of animals or plants, very unlike, not only unlike each other, but unlike their parent species. At first, these types derived from a common ancestor would be only varieties, but varieties are incipient species, Given sufficient time and the intervention of natural barriers to prevent the crossing of extremes, and the creation of new species would be the natural result. As a vivid illustration of how the law of natural selection works, and of how great is the sum of the results of its operation accumulated through many generations, let us observe one of many modifications an animal undergoes in its struggle for existence. To the question... Why are animals of the Arctic regions white? We ought to be able, with what we already know of natural selection, to give the answer. Imagine those lands of snow and ice originally inhabited by animals of all colors, from white to black, or even in all shades of one color, brown. The animals of what colors or shades among the flesh eaters would have the least difficulty in stealthily approaching? their prey, and so be most apt to survive in the struggle against starvation. And which among the animals preyed on would run the least risk of detection, and so be most likely to escape destruction? The answer to both questions, of course, would be those whose colors most nearly conform to the snowy background. Imagine this process of calling cut the darker colors continuing for many generations, and we can understand that the whiteness of all Arctic animals 
would be the inevitable result. We can also see why most wild animals of our regions are of colors that best harmonize with the brown earth and dead leaves. Let us keep in mind the fact that while we were observing the modification of one character, all the fair, favorable variations, however slight, in every other character that could be of the least advantage to those creatures were being added up as fast as they appeared. After several generations, if for any cause the environment were undergoing a radical change, or if a species had migrated from a widely from a wild, widely different one, a greatly mod modified animal would be the result. However, there can be no modification in an animal perfectly adapted to its environment, provided the environment does not change. Every organ and every other part of the body, internal and external, of every creature in the natural state of subject to modification by the law of natural selection, just as was the color of the hair, or the feathers of polar animals. Man's method of improving plants and animals, artificial selection, interferes with the works of natural selection. For one thing, man makes a radical change in the environment of every plant and animal he domesticates. For another, man selects from other purposes than the one nature has in view. That is, if it can be said that natu nat nature has a purpose. From the same parent, stock, man breeds one strain of cattle for beef, another for, mil for milk and butter, one variety of the horse for the saddle, and another for draft purposes. Nature adopts the species to the environment, never the environment to the species. Sacrificing those individuals that do not measure up to her standards, she seems to care only for the species, not for the individuals or only for those individuals that give promise of a better species. This secret wrung from nature, natural selection as a factor in progressive development, is man's most precise truth, for it is the key to his further progress. To summarize, organisms tend to increase at a, greater, at a great rate. This intensifies the struggle for existence. Organisms vary. In the struggle for existence, the vast majority die early, leaving those that vary in the favorable direction to live and reproduce. This means change, progress. This is natural selection. There is also de Vries mutations theory, which some scientists believe to have been an important factor in evolution. It is the theory that at times a species may progress by jumps. That is, that occasionally individuals come into existence that vary extremely from the mass, and that they may become the parents. Parents of a new species. It is on account of the relative value attached by some scientists to this theory and to natural selection that they d disagree, and not in regard to whether or not evolution is a fact. And that will be the end of part two of Little Blue Book number 467, titled Evolution Made Plain, written by John Mason. I'll see you in part three.